Dr. Scott Hahn is the father, Michael Scanlon, professor of biblical theology and the new evangelization at the Franciscan University of Steubenville. He's the founder and the president of the St. Paul Center, an apostolate dedicated to teaching Catholics to read scripture from the heart of the church. Dr. Hahn has been married to Kimberly for 42 years. They have six children and 21 grandchildren. They also have one son ordained to the Diocese of Steubenville, Father Jeremiah Hahn, as the author and editor of over 40 popular and academic books. Dr. Hahn's works include the best-selling titles, Rome, Sweet Home, The Lamb's Supper, Hail, Holy Queen. His most recent releases are titled, Hope to Die, The Christian Meaning of Death and the Resurrection of the Body, and it is right and just why the future of civilization depends on true religion, now available at stpaulcenter.com. We are very grateful to Dr. Scott Hahn, who joins us tonight for our Friday keynote address to inspire and challenge us to cultivate Eucharistic amazement. Let us all give a warm Las Vegas welcome to Dr. Scott Hahn. What a joy it is to be with you this evening, and I have to begin by expressing my heartfelt gratitude to Bishop Thomas for sharing from his heart what is so central and powerful in our lives as Catholics, and also to Bishop Gordon, your baby auxiliary bishop. <laughs> what a joy it is to see you. I had your brother Rick as a student at Franciscan. It's also a joy for me to be with Doug Brown. We go back to ninth grade yeah, in Pittsburgh. And so it's a joy indeed. I would like to build upon what Bishop Thomas has already been sharing with us. It's on our minds, it's in our hearts, and once or twice he referred to what has become my favorite story in all of sacred scripture. It's the story of the two disciples who traveled on the road to Emmaus on Easter Sunday. So if you have a Bible, take it out and turn with me to Luke 24. But of course, we hear this throughout the liturgical year, and so it is so familiar. But I want to look at it in a way that might shed some new light on some of the details. And so we read in Luke 24 about what transpired on Easter Sunday morning. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Now, Emmaus is a town, and archaeologists debate exactly where it is, but seven miles might be misleading. In the Greek, it is 70 stadia. A stadia is 607 feet. But this is not a long, this is not a, a straight or level road. This is long and windy. And so it would have taken a few hours. And of course, we know what happens next because an apparent stranger meets up with them as they were talking with each other about these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Now, notice that. They were prevented from recognizing him. It wasn't that they were not bothering to look up or look into his eyes or listen carefully to the voice of the stranger. No, our Lord, for whatever reason, decided not to disclose his own identity until the right time. And so he said to them, what is this conversation which you were holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. 
Now, the Greek term for sad, skuthropoi, could best be translated more like dejected, demoralized, devastated. They have just come through the single worst experience of their adult lives. So then one of them named Clopas answered him. Now, we don't know much about Clopas. This is the only place he's mentioned. But of course, we do know from John's gospel that his wife was there at the foot of the cross, the third Mary. Besides Our Lady, Mary Magdalene, there was Mary, the wife of Clopas. And so from the second and third century sources, we know from Hegesippus that Clopas was actually the younger brother of, get this, St. Joseph. So this is Uncle Clopas. <laughs> we also know that he became the father of the second bishop in Jerusalem. And in just a couple of weeks on September 25th, we have the optional feast for, guess what? St. Clopas. So one of them named Clopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have happened there in these days? Think about how ironic that is. <laughs> who did you just ask that question to? <laughs> the only person in Jerusalem who knows exactly what's happened <laughs> because it happened to him. You know, and I think our Lord might have been tempted if he had been more like me to say, you know, I don't need this. I don't deserve this. But instead, he accommodates himself to these two troubled men and says, what things? And they said, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all of the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered, delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. So they're basically pouring out their hearts in terms of what had happened just in the last few days. And what a turnaround. You contrast Palm Sunday, Hosanna in the highest, to then Good Friday, crucify him, crucify him. How fickle the crowds, but also how corrupt these leaders. But then verse 21 we read, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. But that verb is in the past tense. We had hoped. They no longer do. Their hopes have been dashed by some of the darkest hours that they could possibly endure. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's now the third day since it happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb earlier in the morning. They had seen, they didn't find his body. They had come back saying they'd even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. But I can't help but wonder if they didn't begin that line by saying, some women from our company. You know, it's like, what are the chances that he would appear to women before the men, before the apostles, the hierarchy as it were? And at this point, you'd half expect our Lord to offer some words of comfort and consolation. Cheer up. It's not as bad as it seems. Trust me. But no, instead our Lord turns to them and says, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did you catch that? O foolish men and slow of heart? He just added insult to injury. It almost feels like he's rubbing salt into an open wound, but of course he's not. He knows that these words are hard but necessary to really diagnose a condition that they had that we sometimes have as well. And then he went on, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things before entering into his glory? At which point I suspect those two men were half tempted to say, no, stranger, it wasn't necessary that the Christ should suffer. What was necessary was that the enemies of the Messiah, they should have been the ones doing all of the suffering. You don't know anything. But instead, they let him go on, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things before entering into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he interpreted them in all of the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Whoa. Now, I've already taken five or six minutes summarizing what probably took place in less than four minutes. That brief exchange was immediately followed by 
what must have been not only a rather long exposition of sacred scripture, but the single most exciting Bible study in all of salvation history. Why was there no recording, not even amplification for anybody but these two apparent nobodies, Clopas and his friend? Who was that unnamed? We don't know, we can speculate. My favorite theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas, surmised that it might have been Luke himself, since he's so modest, but he also knows the details. But regardless, beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he interpreted to them in all of the scriptures the things concerning himself. You just have to wonder, what did he share? Beginning with Moses, that means going all the way back to the beginning, the first five books of the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, there is it in Genesis. And so what's happening there? Well, I suspect he might have touched upon Abraham, the paragon of faith, and the ultimate test of faith, which came to him as a kind of final exam, when after waiting a century for a child, then at last Isaac is born, and what does our Lord say in Genesis 22, verse one? Abraham, Abraham, here am I, Lord. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, and offer him as a holocaust at the place that I will show you. Now, in the Greek translation, it's take your only beloved son, a phrase which we readily recognize but associate with the New Testament, but there it is for the first time with this man, a father who is faithful, offering his only beloved son as a holocaust at the place that the Lord will show. And so they arrive, and what happens next? They ascend the mount, Mount Moriah, and the boy, the son, Isaac, is carrying the wood to the top of the hill. And he says, here's the wood and the fire. Where is the lamb for the sacrifice? That is a very reasonable question. But it indicates that this was not child sacrifice. This was not the slaughter of an infant. The very fact that he was strong enough to carry the wood to the top of the hill is what caused the rabbis to have a consensus shared by the early church fathers that he was probably a mid to late teenager at the youngest, perhaps older, certainly capable of withstanding his aging father's intention if he so willed. And so the rabbis and the early church fathers agreed that he was a willing victim who gave consent, but at the same time asked the reasonable question, where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And what does his father say? The Lord will provide himself the lamb. And what is that? I mean, at one level, I suspect that it was a heartfelt prayer. Lord, hear our prayer, provide the lamb. On the other hand, I suspect that these two disciples discovered that day, it was also a prophecy, a kind of oracle because the father and the beloved son continued on to the top of Moriah where Isaac is bound, and the father obediently yet reluctantly lifted the dagger, and then the voice of the angel of the Lord from heaven. Do not lay a hand upon the lad, now we know, now we see that you fear the Lord. And he sees the ram caught in the thicket, and he offers that instead, and the father gets his only beloved son back in Genesis 22, as we read in verse four, on the third day, Hmm. Now we know where Moriah is from 2 Chronicles 3.1. It's a range of hills, including this prominent hill called Calvary, Golgotha, where that sacrifice that was suspended is completed by a father who is even more faithful than Abraham, offering his only beloved son as a holocaust when in fact the Lord provided himself the lamb and yet he received his only beloved son back on the third day. So connecting the dots, we're not even halfway through Genesis. I suspect we're not even to mile marker 1.1 yet. But their hearts were already beginning to burn within them. And so on to Exodus. I suspect Exodus 12 might have been a stopping point since they were still in the midst of celebrating Passover, and that's where the legislation for the first Passover was given, where you take a male lamb, unblemished, 
with no broken bones and offer that as a sacrifice and you take the hyssop branch and you sprinkle the blood and then you gather as a family to partake of the communion of that lamb in order to flee to freedom through the great exodus under the leadership of Moses but the power of the Lord God. And so if they had bothered to compare notes, they might have noticed that in fact the two thieves had their legs broken to expedite their deaths, but Clopas' wife could have told him what had happened to Jesus. Why? Because he was already dead. Thus to fulfill the scripture, as we read in John 19, not a bone of his shall be broken. What scripture? Exodus 12, verse 46. And of course, John also notes the detail of the hyssop branch lifted to his lips, as well as the seamless linen garment that was taken by the soldiers. And so these details that are there in the Old Testament, and mind you, Clopas and his companion were not numbered among the 12, but they were followers of Jesus. Therefore, they were not ignorant of scripture. They knew the law and the prophets. These stories were familiar, but it's one thing to read them forward. It's another thing to read them backwards after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And I would just stop and say for a one moment that this is true for us as well, that the grace of conversion that came to them can come to us when we realize that when you read the Old Testament as we should, it's something like of a story in search of an ending. The people of God are in exile captivity. And all of these promises are just kind of hanging there, seemingly unfulfilled. Whereas we tend to prefer the New Testament, but the New Testament is theologically unintelligible apart from the old. And so it's only when you bring them together with Christ at the center, does it really come alive. And so I suspect that after Exodus 12, they're not even halfway through the book of Exodus, there was more to follow. The parallels between Moses and Jesus might have begun to pop off the pages of sacred scripture. And why? Because we know that God sent a savior to save his people and Jesus, but it wasn't the first time God had sent a savior named Moses over a thousand years before. And just as the savior needed to be saved because he was targeted by a tyrant named Herod who wanted to take him and all of the Hebrew male children there in Bethlehem. So likewise, Moses, the savior needed to be saved because of a tyrant named Pharaoh who targeted him and all of the Hebrew male children there as well. So after saving the savior, you could have begun to see other parallels and convergences because at this appointed time, the Exodus occurs, the Passover, and Moses leads the people out and across the Red Sea into the desert where the Spirit led them in terms of testing. But likewise, when you continue reading the gospel, you discover that, well, what happened in order to save the Savior? There was a man named Saint Joseph, who's described as the son of Jacob, who's also characterized as righteous, and he's given dreams. Does any of that sound familiar? Oh, yeah. You go back to the law of Moses and there is Joseph, the patriarch, the son of Jacob, described as righteous, who's given dreams to lead the holy family to safety where? To Egypt of all places. Huh, where did Saint Joseph lead the holy family? To Egypt. Hmm, what a coincidence. And so when Israel came out with the leadership of Moses across the water into the desert, you also then discover that Jesus is baptized, he passes through the water, and immediately he was led by the Spirit out into the desert where he proceeded to fast for 40 days and nights like Moses did, during which time he underwent the temptations that Israel underwent. But of course, we know how they fail the tests that came to them. And of course, Jesus passes the test with flying colors, and why? Because he quotes the scripture, so did Satan. But Jesus goes specifically to Deuteronomy 6 through 8. All three times he's quoting Deuteronomy because man doesn't live by bread alone, not even the miraculous manna that he provided for us each day. You live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And likewise, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test, especially if he's in the process of testing you. And you shall worship him alone, not that golden calf you made when I was on top of Sinai. 
Jesus seemed to know exactly where to go and what to quote because he was bringing about a new covenant, a new law. So what does Moses get on top of that mountain? He gets the law of God, the law of the old covenant. What does Jesus turn around and do as soon as he's done passing the tests for 40 days in the wilderness? He gives us what we call the Sermon on the, the Sermon on the Mount. There's a new mountain because there's a new Moses. There's a new law because there's a new covenant. But he starts the sermon by saying, I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've come rather to fulfill them. And so this is the pattern of promise and fulfillment that was embedded into the narratives of the law and the prophets. But not until the fulfillment comes are you really suddenly illuminated. But even then, by a mile marker 1.9, as they're getting through Exodus, they're not quite seeing it. Moses, even with the law of God, needed more help, and so he chose from the 12 tribes 12 princes to assist him in governing the people of God. What does Jesus do as soon as the sermon is done? He chooses from his many followers 12. What a coincidence. No, not even close. You'll sit on 12 thrones and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. But even with the help of the 12 princes, Moses needed further assistance. So on another occasion, he chose 70 elders and anointed them to assist him in the 12. Like our Lord who looks out and says the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are too few. And so on that day, what did he do? He appointed 70 additional disciples and anointed them with the spirit to assist him in the 12. Kind of reminds you of what Mark Twain once said. History does not repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme it's like divine poetry, but you have to have the light of Christ. Even with the help of the 12 and the 70, Moses still grew weary, and so one day he spent that day alone in prayer on top of the mountain, but he chose from the 12, the three who were closest, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu accompanied him up to the mountain. When he went off to pray and he returned, his countenance was glowing with the glory of God, fading though it was. They asked him to put on a veil because they couldn't even look at his face. Reminds us of what? Jesus spending the day in prayer on top of Mount Tabor. He chose from his 12, the three that were closest, Peter, James, and John, and they accompanied him up the mountain. And what do they witness? The transfiguration. And what else? Moses and Elijah. Moses gave the law. Elijah was the greatest of the prophets. And there they are talking about what? Jesus' departure, which was soon to take place in Jerusalem, Luke 9, 31. But what's the Greek word for departure is exodus. That must have gotten Moses puzzled because, I mean, who is Moses but Mr. Exodus himself? But there's a new and greater one. And if Moses had bothered to compare notes, well, you know, I, I performed a number of miraculous signs before the new exodus, exodus occurred. Like what? Well, I, I, I turned water into blood, the water of the Nile and the water in the stone jars there in Exodus 7. Our Lord could have said, well, okay, my first sign was turning water into wine, the water in the stone jars, the same term that's used. Okay, well, I fed the multitudes in the wilderness with God's help, but I took five loaves, two fish, and fed the 5,000 and filled 12 baskets. I was persecuted by the leaders. Yep, been there, done that. Well, I healed a leper. Yeah, several in my case. I mean, they could have gone down that list and understood, in fact, what was true, that the new was concealed in the old and the old was revealed and fulfilled in the new, but they didn't see it. Not because they didn't know the scriptures, but because they had to come to a grace of ongoing conversion in their own relationship with their master, their rabbi, the Lord Jesus. And we could go on. We could look at Isaiah 53, like a lamb led to the slaughter. We could look at other passages throughout the law and the prophets. Suffice to say, this must have been the most exciting Bible study of all time, and yet at no point did one of them stop and say, wait a minute, who else could do this? I mean, isn't there something vaguely familiar about this stranger's voice? No. They just kept walking. They just kept listening. They just kept taking it in until finally they drew near to the village to which they were going, and he appeared to be going further. So they constrained him, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. They spent most of Easter Sunday, late morning and afternoon, walking that long and windy and hilly road, and so he went in to stay with them. And that's when it happens. 
when he was at the table, he does something. He actually does four things. He took the bread and blessed it. He broke it and gave it to them, and suddenly their eyes were open, and they recognized him. And what happens next? You'd expect our Lord to say, well, it's about time. <laughs> but no, he suddenly vanished. And why? Not because he's playing hard to get, now you see me, or something like that. No, all of the opening up of Scripture was preparing for the breaking of the bread. When their eyes would be opened, the only other time that phrase occurs in the exact sequence of terms grammatically is in Genesis 3, when the old covenant was made, and then the wrong food was consumed, and their eyes were opened to shame and guilt and corruption. Only this is the new covenant, the new Adam, who starts off being tested in a garden like the first Adam, but he goes to the right tree and passes that test. And so this is the Eucharist. This is the antidote to mortality. He does what the first Adam should have done to undo what he did, and then he vanished. And why? Because he's brought them to the point of Eucharistic recognition. The veil is removed. And so he takes, he blesses, he breaks, and he gives. That fourfold action would have been familiar because just two chapters earlier in Luke 22, in the upper room on Holy Thursday, what does our Lord do? He takes, he blesses, he breaks, and he gives. So perhaps this is a flashback, except that Clopas and his companion aren't numbered among the 12, so this is not some kind of sacred deja vu. This is simply the moment that our Lord has chosen to disclose his own identity so that they can witness the resurrected body, blood, soul, and divinity of the Messiah. And so they turn to each other and they finally admit what they've been feeling so long. Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. It'd been a long day, it'd been a long journey. Why don't we spend the night, get up early in the morning and circle back, we'll find the 11, you know, not even an option. They rose that same hour and I suspect they walked much more briskly trying to recall all that they had heard and learned. And when they get to the room where the 11 are gathered, they describe what they had just experienced most of that day. I can almost picture Peter and the other 10 trying to take it. Come on in. What's your name? Oh, yeah, Clopas, right? Yeah, and your friend. So what's been happening today? Yeah, we heard the Lord is raised from the dead. And, and, and you're telling us what? That he spent most of his first day back from the dead walking and talking with, it's Clopas, right? <laughs> uh-huh. I want to believe you. Don't get me wrong, but, you know, we were here. You know, I can almost picture Clopas getting a little defensive. You know, well, maybe if he hadn't denied him three times, <laughs> he'd have been here with you instead of with us, you know? Well, if he had been Clopas, it wouldn't have taken us hours to recognize him, you dolt. You know, it's the perfect occasion for the clergy and the, and the laity to kind of hurl criticisms, but instead, these two lowly laymen just simply bear witness to how their hearts were burning and then their eyes were opened, take it or leave it. They're just being faithful lay apostles. And then, of course, we know what happens next. As they were saying this, Jesus himself stood among them. But they were startled and frightened, supposing that they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? Why do questions arise in your heart? See my hands and my feet? It is I myself, and see, for a spirit has not flesh and bones as you see that I have. And while they disbelieved for joy and wondered, he said to them, do you have anything to eat? I love that. You know, a descent to Hades. I mean, that really leaves a man famished, you know. No, this was not primarily because he was famished. He wanted to restore fellowship. He wanted to renew the covenant with them as he had done for the two earlier that day. What happens next to me is rather startling, even though we've heard it all of our lives. We have filters built in, I suspect. And he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead 
and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses. Both groups, just the two and the 11. Again, these people were not ignorant of Scripture. They were not unaware of what our Lord had said about not abolishing the law and the prophets, but fulfilling them. And they were already converted. Follow me. And they've been following him for years. And they were out to kind of convert others, but they didn't think that they needed the grace of conversion. But that's exactly what they needed. And that's exactly what we need also. And so when we look at this story, it's like peeling back the layers and then discovering layer after layer after layer. Each year I do a retreat during Lent and each retreat I focus on this story. And for more than 20 years, our Lord has never fail, failed to peel back yet another layer and just show me just how deep and beautiful, how simple and powerful the story is. And of course, it's more than a story that happened on Easter Sunday. It really is the synthesis, the summation of the story of salvation history, of all of the promises, of all of the prophecies. But you've got to just stop and ask yourself a question. At least I did recently on my retreat. If you were the Lord, if you were Jesus, and you just endured this horrendous suffering, the false accusations, the spit, the thorns, the torture, the abuse, the scourging, which itself could be a death sentence, and then the crucifixion, and there were no loincloths on the victims. It was humiliating as well as excruciating. And then he is dead, he is buried, he descends into Hades, and what do we have today? It's Easter Sunday. It's his first day back from the dead. Now, let me just put it to you in a straightforward way. If you were Jesus and you had endured all of this, and this was your first day back from the dead, how do you think you would choose to spend it? In your own imagination, just come up with three or four options, you know. For one thing, I would probably want to drop in on Our Lady, my mother, you know, and thank her for her prayers because even if the disciples had lost faith, she surely didn't, and her prayers were probably a subtle but powerful instrument in his own resurrection. I would also certainly drop in on Pontius Pilate <laughs> and just say, you know, Pilate, can you show me those hands that you washed? You cynical, corrupt politician, you know? And I'd certainly drop in on Caiaphas and Annas and maybe hover over the Sanhedrin and say, I'm back. <laughs> You have a lot to rethink. I might track down the soldiers who drove the nails into my hands and feet and ask for my seamless linen garment back. <laughs> you know, we could all come up with our lists, but I dare say if we did, not a single one of you would put on your list, even if you had 10 or 15. You know what I'd like to do on my first day back from the dead? I'd like to conduct a really lengthy scripture study with two lowly lay nobodies who won't even recognize me until I take blessed break and give. And then I wanna go back in the evening and lead on my first day back from the dead a second extensive study of the law and the prophets and the writings. I mean, Lord, with all due respect, you appear to have misplaced priorities. <laughs> and I think he would say, au contraire, mon frere. <laughs> we're the ones who have misplaced priorities. We tell ourselves that we're willing to take God at his word, but we're not willing to spend that much time studying it. But it's not just like scripture scholarship that Jesus is valuing. No, what it is, of course, is the paradigm of who we are as Catholics and what we do in every mass because the breaking of the bread back in the first century became an idiomatic expression for what we would call the Eucharist, what we would call the holy sacrifice of the mass. You see it at Pentecost in Acts 2, 42 through 46. This is the paradigm and how it is that you hear the Old Testament promises and then you read the gospel and you discover Christ fulfilling all of the law, all of the prophets, but not just back then and there in the first century, but here and now in the 21st century because a priest empowered by the Spirit who's just a mortal man, 
who speaks these human words over these earthly elements of bread and wine, and yet somehow completely transforms them into what? What Jesus did. And that is not just his body, blood, soul, and divinity, but his resurrected body, blood, soul, and divinity. This is the main event. This is the hinge in which all of history turns. It's subtle, but it's significant. More perhaps than we realize even up until tonight. And so it is that in 1970, the Catholic Church adopted this new lectionary that brings about a 400% increase in the amount of Old Testament readings we have. So that for the last 52 years, Catholics who go to Mass have been exposed to every, practically every single period of salvation history, every part of sacred scripture, and it's always ordered to the fulfillment in the Gospels by our Lord. But the fulfillment is really not primarily there. All of that is preparation for the celebration when Jesus, working through the priest, takes, blesses, breaks, and gives once again. This is the sacred mystery of the Holy Eucharist. And I would propose to you that it's the key that unlocks Scripture. But conversely, Scripture is the key that will lead us more deeply into the grace of Eucharistic conversion. Jerome famously said, as a great saint and doctor of Scripture, that ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. But more recently, Pope Benedict pointed out that ignorance of Christ's real presence in the Holy Eucharist is a form of ignorance of Scripture as well. I know, been there, done that for 10 years as an evangelical Protestant, as a Presbyterian minister who wasn't simply non-Catholic but anti-Catholic because of that wafer that you all worship, give me a break. A totem pole is not as low as that until I began to reread the scriptures through the eyes of the church fathers and then I began to realize that no, I can be wrong. And just like Clopas and his friend, you know, it, our problem is not that we don't know. It's that we don't know that we don't know. So we act like we do know. And we would pass a polygraph until our Lord opens the eyes and the scales will fall for us like they did for Saul on the road to Damascus. And always this is what God wants. When I was an evangelical, I look back on my own conversion experience. It goes back to when Doug and I played guitar in a band. I won't go into the sordid details. We ended up in juvenile court with Officer Truver and all of the rest. I'll stop there, Doug, I promise. <laughs> but that was the moment that the grace of conversion came to me and my parents didn't think it came too soon. And it was really exciting and yet there I started studying scripture. And I got really decent formation, went off to college, studied Greek, to seminary, got the Hebrew, but it was only when I found the early church fathers that I began to realize that all of this is pointing to the Eucharist. And we celebrated the Lord's Supper four times a year. Our services were pastor-centered, sermon-centered, not Christ-centered, as Bishop Thomas was just inviting us to be centered on the Eucharist, to be truly Christocentric. And what I found in the Church Fathers ruined my career, it changed my life, and it made Scripture come alive so that I could say my heart was burning for more than 10 years, but my eyes were open in the breaking of the Eucharistic bread when I first went to my first Mass. And it's been like that ever since. I want to tell you a story of what happened to me recently. A few years ago, I got stopped at the Pittsburgh airport. I grew up in Pittsburgh. I'm 25 minutes away from the Pittsburgh airport in Ohio, there in Steubenville. And so I get stopped fairly regularly, and this guy said, are you Scott Hahn? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, you don't recognize me? And I'm thinking, that's not how EWTN, that's not how TV works, you know? <laughs> it's a one-way medium, it's not two, you know? <laughs> when Miss Janie on Romper Room told us that she could see us, that wasn't true, all right? <laughs> And I'm like, uh, I'm not sure. And he said, come on, St. Clair High back in 75, and then the scales fell from my eyes. I'm like, wow, Chris, long time no see. I gave him a handshake, and he turned it into a bear hug. And he's like, I've been waiting for this day. And I'm like, 
great, why, you know? <laughs> and he said, because I am now what you are. I'm an evangelical, Bible-believing, New Testament Christian, not that silly Catholic kid you knew back in high school. <laughs> well, okay, I've got news for you, Chris, because <laughs> I'm an evangelical, Bible-believing, New Testament Catholic Christian, not that silly anti-Catholic kid you knew back in high school. I mean, like trauma. And he's like, no way, not you. I'm like, yeah, way, me, yeah. <laughs> and he pulls out his business card. He said, you gotta give me a call. And I pulled out mine. I said, you give me a call. And one week later, sure enough, he did. And we exchanged greetings in less than 20 seconds. And then he brought it up, what it was like in the cafeteria after my conversion. Then in 10th grade, I would come in would sit down at the table there in the cafeteria. They'd be talking the sports, the weather, the Steelers, the Pirates, whatever. And I would join in with them because I was a big sports fan. But I'd always somehow turn the conversation to spiritual matters of religion, or so he told me. I'm like, okay, I remember that, but that sounds like what I would have done. Oh, you did it more than once. <laughs> and you would ask us questions like this one. I remember quite vividly. Where in the New Testament do you find the sacrifice of the Mass? You remember that? No, I don't. Well, you would always go on and point out, because you knew we didn't know the Bible, that the sacrifice of the Mass is not a sacrifice, it's a meal, that the sacrifice is Calvary. I'm like, yeah, that's what I thought back then. Well, if you don't mind, I'm going to turn the cafeteria tables right around on you and put to you what you put to us. Where in the New Testament do you find the sacrifice of the Mass? And at one level, I'm thinking, make my day. You know, this is what I live for. But at a deeper level, I was looking for the grace of the Holy Spirit to really build a bridge. And so I said, well, okay, first of all, let's just recognize that as believers in the 21st century, we share much more in common than where we diverge. He said, you never made it seem like that back in high school. And I said, well, I didn't think of it that way. I didn't see it. But yes, of course, as a Catholic, I would say that the Eucharist is a meal. It was the Last Supper. It's the Lord's Supper, as St. Paul calls it. And Calvary is, of course, the sacrifice like all Christians in the 21st century profess. And you could hear him sigh like, whew, I thought you were a real Catholic there. And I, and I said, oh, well, this is what the church believes. But what all Christians profess in the 21st century about Calvary being the sacrifice is precisely what none of the disciples could have possibly recognized, even if they'd been there on Good Friday standing at the foot of the cross at Calvary. It's like, what are you talking about? A sacrifice. As devout Jews, those disciples would have known that for a sacrifice to take place, it has to be inside the Jerusalem temple on top of an altar with a Levitical priest standing by to offer the sacrifice. Jesus was crucified outside the walls, far from the temple, where there were no altars. What we would have witnessed, what we would have recounted to our family members and friends later in that day, would hardly have been a sacrifice. It would have been a Roman execution, plain and simple, brutal and bloody, but not a sacrifice. And once I realized that, it became rather important for me to figure out, okay, how in the world did a Roman execution get turned into a sacrifice, one so holy that it ended up retiring all of the animals that were being offered in the Jerusalem temple? And I, Chris said, I, I don't know. And I said, I didn't either. And I went on a search to find the answer to that question. How does an execution get turned into a sacrifice? And all of the early church fathers kept pointing back to Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, where Paul just simply reminds the Corinthians about how Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the feast. And the feast that he goes on to explicate in the subsequent chapters is what we call the Eucharist. But notice, Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. You can get a sense of what Paul is doing. He's connecting what happened on Good Friday to what had previously happened on Holy Thursday. Because what were they doing in the upper room that night before? They were celebrating the Passover, Chris. But that's not all. He was fulfilling it as the Lamb of God. But he wasn't fulfilling it by retiring it or doing away with the Passover, but by transforming the Passover of the Old Covenant into the Passover of the New Covenant. But I said, but was the Passover in the Old Covenant? Was it just a meal? No, secondarily, it was a meal. Primarily, it was a sacrifice. Just ask any lamb if he can talk, he would tell you, this is more than a meal. 
But if that was true in the old covenant with the Passover, it isn't less true in the new because now you don't have an irrational animal with his throat slashed and his carcass roasted so that we can eat it. No, Christ is the lamb who lays down his life out of love to fulfill all of that. And I said, but if the Eucharist that he instituted in the context of the Passover is just a meal, then Calvary is nothing but a Roman execution. But if the Eucharist, Chris, is more than a meal, if the Eucharist is precisely how Jesus is establishing the new covenant, Passover, then it can't be just a meal or it wouldn't even rise to the level of a Passover. But this is what would have illuminated the mystery of what they watched and what they heard that night because they'd grown up Jewish. They knew the Seder. They knew the liturgy, probably like the back of their hands. But what they didn't know is what Jesus meant when he took that unleavened bread and spoke words that we've heard all of our lives. They never heard it before. Take this and all of you and eat of it. This is my body given up for you. What was that little rhetorical flourish? Well, apparently nobody interrupted and asked for an explanation because they're back on track in just a minute. But there at the end of the Passover, once again with the chalice of blessing, the third cup of the Passover, he speaks words that we've heard all of our lives. These disciples had never heard before. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. What is this ritual addition? You don't just improvise in the middle of a sacred liturgy, but there he goes. And they might have been tempted to interrupt again, but Chris, they didn't. And they, they, they shortly leave, and then everything begins to fall apart. But if they had recollected all of that on Good Friday, they would have realized that he had offered his body before they laid hands on it. They'd already offered his blood as a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins, that he wasn't losing his life on Friday at Calvary if he was laying it down out of love on Holy Thursday, that he wasn't the victim of Roman violence at Calvary. He was the victim of divine love and mercy. And Chris said, what did you just say? And I'm thinking like probably 10 pages worth, you know? What do you mean? He said, you said something a few minutes ago that really struck, if the Eucharist is just a meal, Oh, yeah, then Calvary is just an execution. But if the Eucharist is where the sacrifice is initiated because the Eucharist is instituted as the Passover of the New Covenant, then Calvary is where that sacrifice is consummated. It's one and the same sacrifice. You can't understand either action without the other. They're mutually illuminating. One hand washes the other, Chris. I said, but if Holy Thursday is what transforms Good Friday from being an execution into the consummation of the sacrifice, then clearly we can see how Easter Sunday transforms that into the Blessed Sacrament. Because his body, it's the same body that was in the upper room, it's the same body that was hanging on the cross, it's the same body that was buried on Holy Saturday and descended into hell, but more specifically, more accurately, what we as Catholics affirm and profess is that in the Eucharist, we have the resurrected body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. That in the Triduum, in the Paschal mystery, you have one event of the memorial of his death and resurrection. And he's like, whoa, you're blowing my mind. And I get it, Chris, it blew my career to smithereens. <laughs> but it showed me that our Lord was present body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Holy Eucharist. So whatever I gave up professionally isn't even worth comparing to what I got in finding the deepest possible relationship with the Lord Jesus. And he's like, I need time. Of course you do, and you can have it. He said, can I call you back? I said, sure, whenever you want. One week later, this guy seemed like a glutton for punishment. So he's like, okay. And I'm saying, hey, Chris, what's up? He said, well, it's go back to something, I'd like to ask you, where in the New Testament do you find the sacrifice of the Mass? And I'm like, okay, square one, huh? <laughs> and I said, once upon a time, we talked about this, and I said something like, if the Eucharist is just a meal, then he finished my sentence. Then Calvary is just an execution. Oh, so you do remember. Yeah, but go on. But if the Eucharist is where he's fulfilling the old Passover as the Lamb of God by instituting the Eucharist as the new Passover, if this is where the sacrifice is initiated, where, pray tell, is that sacrifice consummated? 
he said, at Calvary. And I said, and how is that perpetuated? Through his resurrection, through his ascension, where as the high priest in heaven, he's offering his own glorified humanity for us. And that humanity is not only deified up there, it's deifying us down here. But since you asked that question, I've been thinking about it all week as well. You have? Yeah, I've been thinking about it, Chris. Where in the New Testament do you find the sacrifice of the Mass? Because back then, all I wanted to be was a New Testament Christian. And that's why I kept diving more deeply into the New Testament. But that's when I discovered you've got to read the Old to see how it's fulfilled by the New in order to discover how the Eucharist fulfills them both. And he's like, what are you talking about? And I said, well, the only time Jesus ever uses that phrase, the New Testament or the New Covenant, kine diatheke in the Greek, you know, it can be translated either way, New Covenant, New Testament. The only time he ever uses that phrase was not once in the public ministry, not in the Sermon on the Mount. It was on Holy Thursday in the upper room in the midst of celebrating the Passover and fulfilling it. What does he say? This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the New Testament, the blood of the New Covenant, Novum Testamenti, Kine Diatheke, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then what did he say, Chris? He went on to say, write this in remembrance of me. Oh, except he didn't. What did he say? He said, do this. Do this. What is this? We call it the Eucharist, but it wasn't called the Eucharist until the last 20 years of the first century. No, what Jesus called it was the New Testament. The only time he ever used that phrase is what he designated what we call the Eucharist. And so... I wanted to understand what it meant to be a New Testament Christian, and then I studied the New Testament, and I discovered the only time he ever uses the phrase, he was talking about the Blessed Sacrament. He was talking about the Holy Eucharist. And not just Luke in chapter 22, verse 20, but Luke's mentor, Paul, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-five, which we heard earlier this evening. Paul was writing to the Corinthians, reminding them, not only that he is a minister of the New Testament, but in 1 Corinthians 11, the first New Testament writer to ever refer to the New Testament, and what does he call it? He said, on the night that he was betrayed, he takes bread, and then after the supper, he takes the chalice. And Paul, the first New Testament writer to speak of the New Testament, isn't referring to 1 Corinthians as he's finishing it up. He's referring to, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the New Testament. Chris, the New Testament was a sacrament long before it became a document. According to the document, <laughs> Luke 22, 20, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, 25. And so when you read this, that's great, but the fact is, he didn't say write this, he said do this. And over half of the 12 never ended up contributing a single book to the collection of 27 that we now call the New Testament, but not because they were lazy or disobeying orders. He said do this, he didn't say write this, and that's what all of them did. A few of them wrote some gospels, but most of them didn't. I said the, the takeaway for me was obvious that to be a New Testament Christian requires me to become a Eucharistic Catholic. And he's like, what? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, what, what else did you, what did you just say about the New Testament? I said, the New Testament was a sacrament long before it became a document, according to the document. And it doesn't devalue or cheapen the document. If anything, it enables you to get much more out of the New Testament, understanding how it fulfills the old, but how the old and the new are read as signs that are pointing to the main event, which is the Eucharist. But that's what Jesus calls the New Testament because it's being renewed right now just as much as it was back then. This is who we are as Catholics. We're New Testament Christians, Chris. He's like, okay, enough. And this went on week after week for a few months until finally he went dark. He went silent. I kind of figured I must have been doing too much too fast, you know. So I sent him a box. I called it in the note a care package, you know, to make up for praying upon him and his friends back in high school. And out of the blue, one day I got a call. I see the identity. I see the caller ID. And I'm like, hey, Chris, long time no here. What's happening? Well, I just read this book of yours that you sent me, Lord have mercy, the healing power of confession. I never thought of confession as being like the mercy, the medicine of mercy to heal us. Yeah, 
Do you know I went to medical school, Scott? I didn't know that. Yeah, got my medical degree, but I never thought of confession as medicine. Now that I do, I'm calling because Carol and I are going home having gone to confession for the first time in 30 years. I'm like, wow, and you're calling me and you sound like you're in a good mood? He's like, we're in a great mood because tomorrow we're going to Mass and we're going to receive the resurrected body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ in the Holy Eucharist. And I just said, thanks be to God. And now he is a co-belligerent. He is on fire. He's now on the board of the St. Paul Center and he's just basically lighting fires wherever he goes like Jesus did not, did not our hearts burn within us as he opened the scriptures. I wanna draw things together now and come to a conclusion because this Eucharistic revival, it's not just Bishop Thomas, it's not just the Las Vegas Diocese, it is the whole country. And it requires a united effort of the clergy and the hierarchy, but also the laity doing their part, doing our part as apostles. You don't have to be a scholar. Sometimes it's just about friendship, bearing witness to what you've awakened to because conversion isn't just what happened to me when I was 14. Conversion isn't just what happened to me 36 years ago when I entered the Catholic Church. Conversion is what had to happen to me this morning as I woke up. Taking up your cross every day is never gonna be easy. It's never gonna be jewelry. It's gonna be hard for which we need God's grace. And nowhere do we find it like we do in the Holy Eucharist. And so there you have Pope St. John Paul II with a baker's dozen, 13 encyclicals, and then he's in a wheelchair and nobody's expecting anything more from that man. And then in 2003, just a couple of years before he dies, in the most painful way, he pens this 14th encyclical, Ecclesia de Eucharistia, the Church of the Eucharist reminding us that it's the source and the center of our lives because it's Christ. But he's calling for more than just a recovery of Eucharistic faith. He's also calling for a renewal of Eucharistic devotion, adoration, benediction. But then in a surprising section, he explains his real purpose in working on this encyclical and getting it out to the whole church, he said, what we really need to do is cultivate Eucharistic amazement. And I think it struck a lot of Catholics as sort of like papal hyperbole. Yeah, right, Eucharistic amazement. I remember reading those words and just stopping and looking at it and rereading it and rereading it. Because what struck me at the time is the same thing that strikes me tonight that as Catholics, we are so accustomed to these big ideas, real presence, transubstantiation, ordination, consecration, apostolic succession, that we don't always see how truly fantastic they are. There's no way all of this can be true, unless of course it is. And it is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth that we call the Catholic gospel. I used to sing Amazing Grace and lead my congregation in that song because I had much of the gospel. But I tell you, we as Catholics have so much more amazing grace. It's amazing how unamazed we are. It hit me even harder about a year and a half ago. You know, we have six kids, you know, one daughter, five sons, one rose, five thorns, you know. <laughs> My firstborn is now Dr. Han the Younger and the Smarter, PhD from Notre Dame, not Marquette under the Jesuits like his dad, you know. And he's teaching scripture to seminarians at Mount St. Mary's. It's so exciting to run into those guys who go on about how exciting it is to learn scripture from him. I taught him everything I know. <laughs> He now knows much more and teaches me much more. But then Gabriel and then Hannah, you know, we have the 21 grandkids from the first three. We don't expect any grandkids from number four because that's Father Jeremiah. <laughs> and a year and a half ago, his old man and his mom were in the front row when the bishop of the Diocese of Steubenville spoke some words and performed some gestures. And then suddenly, we are witnessing 
the subtle spectacle of the sacramental transformation of my son into my sacramental father. And I tell you, it was inexpressible, especially when I'm standing in line behind his mom and behind his bishop, third, to get his new priest's blessing. And then the next day, to go to his first mass, seeing him behind the altar. And I'm thinking at one level, hey kid, you know, come on. <laughs> Up until yesterday, who was the breadwinner, you know? <laughs> Moi. <laughs> so, you know, at every dinner, I could have taken bread. I could have blessed, broken, and given it to him. I could have spoken the words of constant. And you know what would have happened to that bread? Nothing. And so this kid, as of yesterday, is still a mortal man, and he's about to speak, what, human words over earthly matter, and you think you've got the power to do what? To transform bread and wine into the resurrected body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ? Whoa, talk about a good day's work. And we watched, and we listened, and we witnessed this amazing grace. And I realized it wasn't any more amazing because it happened to be my son, but what struck me was how unamazed we get at something that goes beyond the him amazing grace. I would say that what Pope John Paul called for was precisely right. In his own weakness and brokenness with laser beam precision, he said, okay, yes, Eucharistic faith, yes, Eucharistic devotion, but Eucharistic amazement. And let's acknowledge how unamazed we are and defamiliarize ourselves with the things that we've heard all of our lives that we professed. To believe in the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ can easily become just a kind of saying that we profess, like Catholic talking points, or like, you know, a parrot. Polly want a cracker. Body, blood, soul, and divinity rock, you know. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Let's profess it even when we're distracted. But let's also recognize that our Lord isn't just willing to forgive us. He was dying on the cross to do so and now coming in his resurrected glory, hidden under the form of bread and wine to feed us like we have never been fed in any other context. This is who we are as Catholics. This is what we do in the Mass. And this is why Eucharistic revival and Eucharistic amazement isn't some kind of stunning thing. It is the only reasonable response to what Almighty God has done for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we are so grateful and so proud of you and what you accomplished by sending your Son. You gave us your word for ages in the law and in the prophets. And yet we also recognize now that when your word became flesh and dwelt among us, died and rose for us, that what he accomplished back in the first century, he's still doing in the 21st century. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, as your sons and daughters, we ask you to forgive us for taking so much grace for granted. We ask that you would transform not only bread and wine into the resurrected Christ, but you would transform us as sinners into saints and nothing less. Hear us then as we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Clopas, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, I want to encourage you not just to study and grow through reading, but especially through adoration of the Lord of Lords who laid his life down for us, and then he now feeds us with his own resurrected body, blood, soul, and divinity. Thank you so much, dear brothers and sisters. God bless you.